And joining us now here in the studio is Chris Kobrak. He is professor of finance with the ESCP Europe, which they used to call the École Supérieure de Commerce du Paris. Parfait. Bienvenue, monsieur. Merci bien. And of course, you're visiting Prophet Rotman here in Toronto. That's exactly right. Well, it's nice right. to have you here. Perfect. You're, uh, Chris, first of all, welcome. Second of all, you. you're an historian. So we're going to start by taking a look at finance from a somewhat of an historical point of sure. view, if we can. When it comes to modern day finance, the people who are working on Wall Street, the people who are working on Bay Street or at Société Générale, the major players, do they understand financial history in your view? My guess is they don't, but I'm not sure it's a question of whether they know the history or not. It's a state of mind. To what extent do they integrate it into their thinking? Does, uh, do they ask themselves the question, does this make sense, what I'm doing historically? Is it, uh, do they use it as a point of reference? And my guess is they don't. And they uh, don't because? Because the business of business these days is selling the ability to manage things with kind of, uh, with very, how should I say, the buttoned up kind of ways of doing things, very neat solutions that don't require long convoluted explanation. And history is a lot of details and a lot of con conflicting arguments one way or the other. And, uh, I'm also an accountant. There's an old joke about uh, someone searching for an accountant for a position. He says, I want to have a one-arm accountant. I said, why a one-arm accountant? He said, because I, every time I talk to an accountant, he says, says, on the one hand this, on the one hand that. And history is a little bit like that. It's conflicting lessons. It's not the kind of thing uh, that really can give you a guidepost. Tomorrow we're going to do X, Y, or Z. And people in business want to have that kind of guidepost. You just gave away the fact that you're born in New York City. Did I really? X, we see X, Y, and Z in Canada, <laughs> not X, okay, Y, and Z. Sorry, sorry about it. My apologies <laughs> for that. Uh, no, I'm I, very proud I to I hear be you on that, but, but on the one hand, it, it may not serve their interests in making as much profit as possible to know how they are posited in terms of financial history, but are they not interested? Does it not seem as well, if they have interest I, in you it? Know, there, there was a study once uh, done a few years ago that said one of the few things that links all chief executives is that they are avid readers. And I have to assume that they sometimes do a reading of history, financial history, history of their, of their companies. But most companies do very little to, to further their own hi histories. They don't do very much in encouraging uh, a, 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 an intense knowledge of their companies, their banks, to be part of the corporate culture. So you have to feel that the chief executive, uh, it isn't all that important to me. I, I to presume them. you would think. And I worked in business, by the way, for, for, for many years, so, and, and I didn't see it very much there. Uh, but I presume you think it would be in their interests if they did have a better understanding of the history of what they were involved in. Uh, I believe in the long run, yes, but that's part of what is, this, I think, the psychology of the times and in business is that people are not forced to think in a longer term dimension. As a matter of fact, if anything, we have so many incentives to think in, in a shorter term. And quite frankly, it goes even back to the shareholders, because the truth is we have shareholders who don't have a more educated sense of what has happened financially. They're, they're too gullible. They also will believe some of these short-term solutions, short-term magic uh, in, um, innovations, magic innovations that no one really understands. So somebody who had an appreciation of history, either working on the street or a shareholder, would want to know what because it would serve their larger interests. Uh, I think they, they would have to understand what, but they have to first understand that it's not going to pick stocks for them in the short run, that it would be something that maybe five, six, seven, eight years along, they will get no direct benefit from it. I, if, if I could just, I mean, I think one of the benefits of history is a lesson about financial panics. They start and they stop. Okay, that lesson in and of itself, if people understood, would have saved a lot of headaches that we had in 2008. One, it was the hubris that we had with a lot, a lot of business leaders were saying we had cracked it. And the economists, we had it cracked. We were not going to have any more panics. A lot of investors that would never have panics again. The lesson of history is that they come. And as more people think that way, the more likely they're going to do But it. hang on. Surely everybody knows they come and they go. But the question is, how long do they last? And how do you get out of them? Well, that, that's where the good arguments take well, place, don't they? I have to tell you, in the panic, people don't believe that they end. 
okay? And they don't have a sense of what a panic is all about, is that they don't, they, they don't feel that it is possible that there's going to be an end a year or two down the road. And you, you say that people, surely they know. I mean, uh, Bernanke knew that there was a 1931. Uh, but also, I have a quote someplace of Bernanke saying that, that he felt that ec economists had uh, learned enough that we could overcome all of the great, the great macroeconomic dangers that existed in the world. There were other economists who believed that. There were other businessmen who said that the, the panics were a thing of the past. They knew they existed, but they believed that we were in a, the new paradigm. It was called the new paradigm. Can you remember those days in the, uh, the heady days of the end of the 1990s, early 2000s? We have, we're in a new paradigm. I, I remember it well. It wasn't that long ago, actually. <laughs> Let's go through a few of those um, major incidents from history then and mm -hmm. talk about what either was or was not learned. Let's start going back more than 100 years. The Banker's Panic of 1907. Give us the sort of headline of what happened and then what we ought to have learned from it. Big run up in stocks, big run up in some commodities, uh, a crash, uh, and what made it very distinctive, it was a relatively short but very severe crash, both in Canada and in the United States. And uh, what made it very unusual, and, and by the way, in the, the, it resembled 2008 because, in fact, it was a banker's panic. People, bankers, stopped wanting to do business with other bankers because they were afraid they couldn't pay their bills. J.P. Morgan got together the major bankers in New York, I think 20, 22 of them in his library, and said, guys, you're going to pony up this, you're going to pony up this, you're going to pony up this, and we're going to close these banks, we're going to merge these banks, and then put out newspaper uh, um, announcements <coughs> for the newspaper news, and he said, I have it in hand. We're going to do this. This is a very severe uh, crunch here. There's a very serious one. But we've sat down and we're going to take care of the problem. And it reduced the panic. So it did work. It did work. And the bankers themselves who had caused the problem, and one of the things that I find interesting about it, it was, it was an institutional change that caused the problem. The, because of holes in American regulation, a new institution, the trust company, developed. And they were not re well regulated, and the bankers used them to do transactions that they otherwise would Hold off do. on the trust company, because okay. they've got their own scandal still yes. to come. That's well. on our list as well. Uh, let's go, obviously, to the one that uh, Ben Bernanke, uh, the um, chairman of the Fed, has been watching so carefully, the, uh, the Panic of 1931. What did we learn from that? Well, what he learned was that what bankers, the, the great failing of bankers at that time, was that when they should have been increasing the amount of credit available, they actually restricted credit, that, there was, that, they, that they, they did not open up the tills for, for the bankers. And he's probably right that that, that that should have been done then, and it was good that he increased the money supply uh, uh, now. I personally think he's gone too far, and I think why, one of the reasons we're having a slow recovery is that there was more to the crisis than that. Just as in 1931, there was more to the crisis. That that was not the only thing that should have been done. That there were a whole series of other problems in our world banking system that came, that came to the fore at that time, and that they had to be dealt with. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I feel that there's been too, uh, if too reactive, and, and, and I might also add, the assumption that we would have had 1931 all over again, mm. as opposed to 1907, may cause long-term difficulties for us that we, it's very hard to envision now. So the Maybe a longer is, crisis than because may, we didn't think of it as 1907, we thought of it as 1930. Well, maybe Bernanke learned the lesson of the wrong crisis, in other words, to apply to the situation. Is that what well, you're saying? Yeah, and, and you know, the, uh, Nietzsche wrote a great book on the use of history. It's called in English, The Use and Abuse of History. In German, The Nutz and Abnutz von Geschichte. And uh, in it, he said, knowing too much history can be a bad thing, and knowing too little history can yeah. be a bad thing. And sometimes just saying, I'm not going to do what they did in 1931 can be a bad thing to be. For me, you're too possessed by history. OK, let me take you back to the Nixon administration, the end of Bretton Woods, 1971. Again, what's the headline and the significance thereof? Well, I think in that crisis, one of the things that happened was it was a political decision all over the world to shelter people from the ramifications of 
this enormous change in the world macroeconomic system. Brenton Woods, I don't know if your audience remembers, I can barely remember and I'm old enough now. Brenton Woods was a system where we had fixed exchange rates. Uh, all current, major currencies in the world were fixed to, to the dollar. The dollar was convertible into gold. And with, there were some changes in the rates, but by and large it was a fixed state, uh, system. And we moved in the space of a few years. The dollar went down enormously in value, but the real ramification of it is we went to this floating system where basically markets decide every day what the value of the euro is going to be, what the value of the Canadian so the dollar. The relationship between gold and dollars ended. This ended. Ended. And, ended. And gold and the other currencies ended effectively. And this was a brave new world for people mm -hmm. because we had never we had had paper money for around for a long time, but never had that kind of complete detachment from, from gold at that period. And that made people very, very nervous, and there were all sorts of, the commodity prices were increasing. And to shelter people from that, governments and central banks in the world uh, 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 took on policies that and ended up creating what we call those, remember, stagflation? Mm -hmm. and it was basically 10 years where we didn't, it wasn't horrible, it wasn't we didn't have a depression, we didn't have even through the whole time a recession, we just had no growth. And it might have been a much shorter lived uh, um, uh, pr problem if in fact they had not taken all, th all the measures they did to shelter people from from the effects and what we ended up with, we, we had to have in 1981 through 83, a very, very severe recession to wring out the inflation uh, that had, was kind of paralyzing most economies. A few minutes ago, you mentioned the savings and loans that were created as a result of one of the previous crises. On Ronald Reagan's watch, they had their own. They had their own crisis. crisis. And one of the best lessons there relates to something the headlines actually a couple of days ago. It's just been announced that it looks as if the United States government is going to make money from the $800 billion bailout. Now, what the lesson there would have been is the money that is put into stabilizing the system, as was in 2008, in the fall of 2008, uh, is not necessarily money is just given away to the shareholders. The shareholders got very little of it. Not necessarily money that is given away to the managers, who in fact got a lot more, I think, got a lot more money out of it, but in fact, it stabilized the system, and then you don't necessarily lose all that money. And they and they didn't. And savings and loan, they got back most of the money that they had but put you, into it. But you will grant it's better that these things not happen in the first place. Absolutely. Okay. So on that, uh, just, 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 on that, no, just so we're not no, misunderstanding. No, I, I don't. <laughs> okay. Let's try this. Do you think, uh, given all of those lessons of history, and and you know, government, private sector, there are some people, academia, who are certainly aware of what those lessons ought to be. Do you think the lessons are understood well enough that they have actually found their way into government policy at the end of the day? I don't think so. And I'll tell you uh, two things that make me think that's not the case. Uh, the first is you skipped over one of the crises that I was going to talk about, and that there's the long term capital management crisis. I won't go into what detail. What year was that? Uh, 1998. <laughs> And didn't make my list. I didn't make your list. Okay, <laughs> all right. But the the one of the crises that I have written about before, and, and that you uh, we had talked about. I do remember that one. You do remember. Okay. Yeah. Buxley, now, what was her name? <laughs> what was the name? That woman at um, in the Clinton administration. Uh, Born. Clinton? Her last name was Born. But I, I don't now. know that. She blew the whistle on this thing, and they all ignored her. Uh, I, I want to say I some, somebody in the control room Google this for me. It's something right. like Brooksley born or Buxley born, right. and she got Greenspan and Clinton and all these guys and Rubin oh, all well, together. But, okay, but you're going to the next stage of that. The first stage was two of the best people in finance came up with a way of they created a hedge fund with the best traders in Solomon Brothers, and they almost went bankrupt. And here's the thing: what, about, about what we should learn from the past. This was a crisis that was well handled, that we don't talk enough about. Okay. They came in and they took care of the problem, but it made every people overconfident. Long-term capital management was a hedge fund that had 100 billion in assets in tricky, let me call them tricky assets, uh, on its books. But, every, and it, but they, run by superstars that everybody superstars, completely bet. It was the, the best and the brightest. Yeah. Okay. They solved the problem and everybody, Greenspan, Rubin said, you know, we can let everybody do this now because it's clear we can handle it. And what happened by 2008, Citibank alone had five times the amount of assets, the long-term assets and liabilities of these tricky derivative instruments, OTC derivatives, that on their books. 
Deutsche Bank, the same amount. Uh, uh, the, um, uh, most of the other big banks, that uh, uh, Goldman Sachs, I think, even more. The f they forgot the order of magnitude. And that was changed under the Clinton administration. That law was, and I always get this, it was the, the Reform of Futures Commodities Trading Act, which allowed the banks without regulation to deal in tricky, let me call them tricky mm -hmm. OTC derivatives. My colleagues probably going to go nuts when I say the tr tricky OTC der derivatives. They are kind of derivatives that are not traded on public mar markets, and it's very hard to have oversight over them because each one is different, and they're not very liquid. And what happened at, at Lehman Brothers is by the time that rolled around, Lehman Brothers had a million, a million of those contracts, not the amount, a million separate contracts. Now, it's very, very hard for anyone to really have oversight. It's one bank of 20 Th large ones. Thus, it's the Wild West. The Thus, wild, wild West. I and mean, they did Google it, and her name was Brooks Lee Bourne, and she was the one woman who was telling Clinton, yeah, Rubin, she was, Summers, she, Greenspan, all these men she, that things need regulation, yeah. and she was right, and they said... Absolutely. They said, she was Don't head listen of the her. Commodities Futures Trading Board. I yeah, think it's called. that's right. She was, yeah. but she, it was not the long-term capital management. She, it was, she was overruled by Rubin and Sumners yeah. and, and Clinton, and, and it, was, it was wonderful bipartisan legislation. Republicans, Democrats, everybody was on board because it seemed like a no-brainer. And that got us into 2008 as far as that. Okay. And you asked, well, just a follow-up yeah. question, have we really dealt with that problem? No. <laughs> and have we come up, and now one of the other things we have to recognize about the financial crisis is, is that we have these mega multinational banks in the world that, are, that no national government can have effective oversight over. And the G20 has not been effective enough in creating rules that all of these banks have to live by. So the derivatives problem, the two are very related. The derivatives problem plus the mega bank multinational banks, that pro those two problems have not been dealt with, so it would be my answer to you. Okay, so let me ask another one then, emerging out of history as well. If they've looked at all of these different crises over the years, presumably they have, the they, whoever they are, who make the rules, have come to some conclusion about when to get in to try to fix, how much fixing ought to be done, and when it's time to sort of get out of the way and let the market do its thing again. Has there been any kind of consensus that history teaches us about those things? I don't think there's a consensus. I think the regulatory reaction has been, in some areas, they have not entered into where they should go, and in some areas, in too much detail. One of the things that markets and banks and everybody have to, has to deal with is the uh, uh, Dodd-Frank spill, mm. which is 3,900 pages. That I think it's 3,900, call it around 4,000 pages. And people are still writing regulations around it. The Glass-Steagall bill, which reformed American banking in the 1930s, was 38 pages. Okay, mm. Now, they're probably regulations that came afterwards. Clearly, a group of people believe that the idea is to stipulate everything they can possibly think of that banks should be doing, instead of attacking some core principles that we should be dealing with. On the other hand, there are some people who still believe that, that because of the, the overregulation, that we should go back to, to some sort of just deregulation, let the markets work things out for themselves. They say, in some sense, look, we survived this. Maybe things aren't so bad. What do you say? All. I say we have to do more sensible regulation, uh, and we have to attack those two issues globally of derivatives, OTC derivatives trading, and, and mega banks that do them internally because we'll never have oversight in, uh, unless we attack that. But I don't want to destroy the banks. I don't want to destroy derivatives. I just think we have to get, have a better handle than we do now. And people are fooling themselves. With this Thank thing. you for this walk down financial memory lane. If memory lane. Down there, right? <laughs> Chris Kobrak, Professor of Finance, ESCP Europe. Thank you very much for having me. Not at it's all. It's been Thank a real you. pleasure. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.